Well, good morning, church. Glad that you are joining us this morning. Our church family, we're glad you're here. Visitors, we're glad you are here. Or if you're just surfing across the web and you stumbled across us, we are so glad that you are here. If you're able to, give us a shout out. Tell us where you're watching from this morning. We'd love to connect with you, see you uh, where you're at. But we are so, so glad that you are here. We pray that you will engage and worship with us because Jesus is absolutely the best thing, the best news you will ever hear about today or any other day, and we're here to worship him and worship him only. You join us today.
Ladies, True Conference 2021 is this Saturday, February 20th. We are so excited to see you there. If you did not get a chance to register for this year's events, even though it's sold out, you can join us online. All of our general sessions will be live streamed on our church Facebook page as well as the Storehouse Facebook page. And all ladies are welcome to join us this Friday night at 7 p.m. Doors will open at 6.30 for a special pre-conference time of worship and hearing Emma Mae Jenkins speak. It's just for our First Baptist Church ladies. Even if you didn't get registered for the conference, you are welcome to join us on that Friday pre-conference session. We hope to see you there. If there is one thing that a ladies' event needs, it's cookies. We need cookie donations for True Conference. Please plan to bring your homemade or store-bought cookies to the church by Thursday, February 18th. Applications for our church scholarship are now in the log. All applications are due by March 15th. This application is open to all high school seniors and college students. Our quarterly business meeting will be Sunday, February 28th at 6 p.m here in the worship center. Besides our normal year in business, we will also discuss and vote on a constitutional change regarding hiring ministry staff, changes to the internal financial controls, and hiring a youth associate. A Zoom option will be available and copies of the proposed changes are available at the Welcome Center. Hey, make plans to join us Sunday evening at 6 p.m. on February 21st. This will be First Baptist Church Deacon Ordination. We will be setting aside three men for the deacon ministry. This is always a wonderful service. Hey, for those of you that are watching this service in your home with your family, go ahead and turn to your kids and say, those are commercials. Those are what we had when we were kids. You know, and all kidding aside, man, we're so glad to have you this morning here at First Baptist Joplin. And I want to just say, if you are one of our first-time watchers, if you're one of our first-time people to ever connect with us, or even a second time, we would love for you to take just a moment this morning and right there in the comment section on this live feed, if you would just write first-timer, um, just let us know this is one of your first times. We're so glad that you popped in to be a part of this worship service. So this is the time of the service where we normally worship through giving. We would love to invite you, if possible, uh, for you to go ahead and give either electronically or make that check and then mail it out this week. God has been so good and so faithful. We continue to pray as leadership for wisdom and insight into how to appropriately utilize the funds he's provided for us to maximize the gospel of Jesus Christ. So glad you all are here. I'm going to ask you for a moment if you'd join me as we pray. God, your ways are not our ways. You are much higher and greater than we are. And Lord, we try to pretend that we have it under control. We try to pretend that we understand. We try to pretend, Lord, that we, uh, we have our hands on the wheel, but truthfully, we don't. And I'm grateful, Lord, that in the midst of the things that change, there are, there's one thing that never changes, and that's who you are. There is no shadow of turning with you. You continue to provide a way for your word to go forth. You continue, uh, Lord, to work in the hearts of your people. And I believe, God, what you are doing on the other side of this storm is something that we have never seen before, and we look forward to that reunion. But until then, Father, help us to be faithful to you, faithful in our day-to-day -day life, faithful in pastoring and leading our own homes, faithful to our families, faithful in giving and worshiping to you. Father, we love you, and we thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
blessed Trinity. There's be a theme throughout all these songs we sing this morning, that God is holy, he's worthy of all that we have and all that we are. As we worship him, continue to realize that we worship a holy, holy, holy God.
soul shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed tree.
you're holy. God, we thank you that the standard was set by you. Because of your holiness, we can experience salvation through you. God, we thank you for the free gift that you give to us. God, I thank you that we have the freedom to worship you. God, thank you for access that we have to you to just pray, to lift up our voices, to talk to you as your children. God, we pray that as we have sung these songs, God, as we've spoken these words, it's been a sweet sound to your ear, God. God, we want to glorify, magnify you above all things. You are so holy, so worthy as we've, as we've sung this morning. But God, now as we open your holy and worthy and righteous word, God, we pray that you would convict our hearts. God, you would uplift our hearts. You would uplift our spirits. But God, you would speak truth to us that changes us today. It's in your powerful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, in the time of crisis and change and challenge, the church is uniquely equipped to be able to be the the vessel, the vehicle in which God uses to bring about hope to the world. It's always been that way. In the time of crisis, God has always used the church. In the time of uh, great joy, the church has always been there. And today is no different. Today, last week, we looked at the message and the mess. In the midst of all that's going on, What can we take from that? What is God saying? What has God typically said in the midst of trials and challenges and tribulation in the life of believers? This morning we look at the blessings of the mess. Not just what is God saying, but what what are some things that we find throughout some challenges in our lives or in Scripture where we see God delivering, using messes to be able to deliver this package of blessing to us. And in Acts chapter 27, starting in verse number 13, we find an account, a historical account by Luke the historian, who is giving us some just meticulous details in the life of the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul had had his life transformed by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He was once persecuting Christians, but seeing this vision of the Lord as he was on his way to persecute Christians, he came to faith in Jesus Christ and became a sold-out follower of Christ and a missionary to the Gentiles. And as Paul would preach the gospel and share the gospel wherever he was, whatever he was doing, with whoever was in front of him, he found that gospel message sometimes not being received well. And he was greatly persecuted because of his faith in Christ. And previously, and before this text that we're reading this morning, Paul stands before King Agrippa and shares his testimony. And King Agrippa tells him that he's going to have to go to Rome and and stand trial before Caesar. So Paul is placed on a ship with 275 others, including a, a vast majority of those being prisoners. And he's placed on this ship, and they're sailing to Rome. Now, they have to stop at several ports along the way. And one of the ports they stop at, Paul, who had been shipwrecked several times before in his life, he realizes that there's a storm coming. He realizes this is not going to turn out well. So he goes to Julius, the centurion, the Roman official who's over him and who's over the prisoners. And he goes to him, and he tells him, he says, this isn't going to end well. There's going to be a lot of problems. You're going to lose cargo. The ship's going to be wrecked. The centurion chooses to listen to the owner of the ship. 
And they decide to press on. And chapter 27 tells us in this historical account what happens. Listen to Luke's words in the, in the book of Acts, starting in verse 13. It says, Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called a nor'easter or a Euroclidon struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Let me stop in verse 15. So Paul has already said there's going to be a storm. There's going to be this bad thing that's going to happen. He knew it. And he tells it to the centurion, and the centurion says, no, never mind, we're going to listen to other people, and we're going to go ahead and go into the storm. We're going to go ahead and make our way to Rome. So he's making his way, and it starts out that everything is fine. The the south wind is blowing. It's all gentle. Everything is nice. Everything seems to be going. And you know that that centurion kind of had to look around at some of the others who, who convinced him to go, and he kind of gave him a wink and a nod, you know. Hey, we're good. Everything is great. Actually, it's perfect sailing conditions. But then something happened. It said in verse 14, but soon a tempestuous wind called a nor'easter. The the same word we get typhoon from. So everything was nice. Everything was calm. The south wind was blowing. Everything was gentle. Perfect sailing conditions. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Out of nowhere comes a nor'easter. Out of nowhere comes this typhoon. Out of nowhere, their lives are changed in this boat, in the sea, and all of a sudden, the storm blows up. You know, we're reminded today that things can change so quickly. I mean, for many of us, it was literally smooth sailing. For many of us, life was predictable. For many of us as pastors, our ministries were predictable. Unfortunately, I say that. Unfortunately, our our calendars seem to be good for days, weeks, months, years out. We could plan and look, and now all of a sudden, everything has changed. Everything. It's almost like everything was smooth sailing, and then came a typhoon. Church, here's here's the point of this message this morning. Luke's account, Luke's details that he gives us in Acts 27 show us some things that we can glean from storms as well. And if you notice in verse 15, we get the first one. What is one of the blessings of the mess? It says in verse 15, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Number one is this. One of the blessings of the mess is that we lose control. Think about it for a minute. They're in a ship. They are literally bound by the wind. They have to go where the wind tells them. So what does it say they do? It says they pulled up their anchor and they just went with it. They had to. And I know for a lot of us, this is just such a a new season, a new chapter in our life. If you think about it, many of us really are uncomfortable with our current situation. We're uncomfortable with the uncertainty that lies in front of us. We're uncomfortable because we love being in control. We love knowing what's coming. We love knowing how long it's going to last. We love all of the things that we can base our plans and our lives and our decisions off of. We don't like this tumultuous situation of not knowing. But if you think about it, as this typhoon is now blowing across the sea and is literally picking this ship up, what would have happened had they left the anchor down? What would have happened had they not pulled that anchor up and secured it back to the boat and let her roll? Tell you what would have happened. It probably would have torn the boat apart. If that anchor would have remained stuck down in the ground and they would have stayed right there where they were and that typhoon wind would be blowing on that ship and pulling it, something would have had to have given. Something would have broken. They may have all perished right there at that moment had they not pulled up the anchor. And you know, as much as we love staying where we are, as much as we love the security and the simplicity oftentimes, as much as we love the security of staying right here, there are times in our life and this season is no different. We have to pull up the anchor. And to some extent, we have to go with it. 
This isn't, if you'd asked any of our staff two months ago, do you ever believe you'll be preaching to an empty church or a near empty church? We'd have said no. We never sat in our staff meetings and planned and organized for an event like this. No. We've had to go with it. And praise God, the grander earth has quaked before. Praise God, we know the one who controls the sea. We know the one who is the God of the storm. So as your life right now is tumultuous, the situations around you are ever-changing, just remember this. One of the blessings of the mess is that it causes us to pull up the anchor and go with it. Because as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we know the one who controls the storms. Number two, down in verse number 22, excuse me, verse number 20, it says, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been out without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Listen to verse 22, church. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, he says, there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, Paul says. For I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. The first blessing of the mess is that it causes us to raise up our anchor and be moved and allow ourselves to be moved. But secondly, the second blessing of the mess is it causes us to trust and rely on the promises of God. Previously in the book of Acts, in chapter 23, we're in chapter 27 here, previously in chapter 23, verse 11, God says this to the Apostle Paul, take courage. For as you have testified of the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify to me in Rome. What did God tell Paul previously? You're going to Rome and you're going to have an audience. And that was a promise that Paul had that entire time. Paul knew that when he got on that ship, it didn't matter what storm was coming, he knew he was going to make it to Rome. But one night, while Paul was on that ship, thrown about, darkness, no clouds, or all these clouds, you can't see the stars, you can't navigate, everybody's seasick, and this has gone on for days and days and days, no doubt they're wet and cold, this angel of the Lord appeared to Paul and said, don't worry, everybody on the ship is going to be okay. Now let's put this in context. That was a promise uniquely given to Paul in that time for that situation. I can't stand in front of you as pastor of the church and say that every one of us is going to be okay. I haven't had that same word from God in the same way. But you know what? I still have the promises of God for my life. And in the midst of a storm, in the midst of this typhoon, it's all around us. I still go to the promises of God's Word. What are some of the promises of God's Word that we have? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The first promise is this, if I am a child of God, if I have been born again, I have everlasting life. I am an eternal son of an eternal father. Another scripture I have as a great promise, especially in the time of uncertainty, is this. In John chapter 11, verse 25, at the grave, at the grave of Jesus' friend Lazarus, he says to Lazarus' sister, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Jesus said to her? Another promise of eternal life. And then another promise for us to be able to grab a hold of, a stronghold in these times of uncertainty. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 35. What a promise for the believers. Who, is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are as regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, all these things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why could Paul... Be so strong in the midst of that storm. While everything is spinning and and twirling, while everything is going around and the wind is blowing, why could one man stand there and be so strong in the midst of that? Because he had a promise. Because he knew the destination. That's the important part. God told him, you're going to go to Rome. You're going to speak to Rome. And Paul realized, until I speak at Rome, I'm literally invincible. He knew that nothing was going to come against him. Nothing was going to be able to prosper or profit against him until he spoke at Rome. You and I have a promise. You and I have a destination. That's heaven. For everybody that is called on the name of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, in the midst of all of the blowing of the wind, in the midst of all of the typhoon that seems to be around us, in the midst of all the uncertainty, we are able to stand on solid ground because of the promises of God. Not that I know that I will live, but that rather I will live forever. Not that I know that I will survive, but that right now I am abiding in Christ. The blessings of the mess, we lose control. Another blessing of the mess, we trust the promises of God. Number three, verse 18, 19. Since we were violently storm-tossed and began the next day to jettison the cargo, And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Look in verse 38. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Those three verses record three actions of the people on the ship. They took the cargo, not the people, but the cargo that they were hauling with the people, and they took the cargo and they threw it overboard. Friends, remember, this was a business venture. They were throwing over their profits. And then they take some of the tackle or some of the the key components of the ship, and they realize they were heavy, and they throw those overboard as well. And then in verse 38, they throw over the food. You know they had to be desperate. Obviously, everybody on that boat was a Baptist because the food went over last. But here's the important thing. The cargo, components of the ship, and the food. At that moment, at those moments in the storm, A judgment call was made. And they believed what was truly important and what was not important. You see, when they started out, they never would have thrown over the cargo. No, no. Were there not a storm, the cargo would have remained. Were there not winds and danger, oh, the tackle of the ship would have remained. 
Would they not need to lighten the load to raise the ship back up? Oh, no. They would have never have thrown over the food. But in the moment, in the storm, in the midst of the typhoon, in the midst of all that is going on, they realize we've got to lighten the load. You know the crazy thing? Is that this mess that you and I are sitting in has caused us to lighten our load. Our calendars are free. We're available. We're spending time with family. We're going for hikes. We're fishing. We're spending time together. You know what? We never would have done this had it not been for this mess. We are able to bond and we're able to yearn and we're able to long for things once again. We have come to the place in our life where we realize what is truly important. And honestly, that's a lesson that we wouldn't have learned apart from this. We've learned the value of life, how to care for one another, what's really important and what's not. And in the midst of trouble, in the midst of trials, we make judgment calls. What needs to stay and what needs to go. There are many of you that are watching this service, some of you anyway, that have gone to the doctor and gotten a report that you didn't want to ever get. You heard words that you didn't ever want to hear. When you heard those words or received that diagnosis, you made a judgment call. What really matters? For some of you, spending time with the people you love was more important than anything. For some of you, going and seeing parts of the world you've never seen before were more important than anything. And for some, the God they had never thought about, realizing their mortality, Cause them to make a judgment call that this God I'm about to stand in front of is more important than anything else. One of the great blessings of the mess is it helps us determine what is truly important in our life as we make those judgment calls. We throw out everything that doesn't matter. It shakes us up to see what is valuable and what is worthless. And finally, verse 39, after 14 days, two weeks, Jason, how many weeks have we been doing this? Two. 14 days. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, and at the same time, loosening the ropes and tied the rudders, then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground, the bow bow and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. And he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to the land. Number four, the fourth blessing in the Mass is that it carries us to new lands carries us to new places, carries us to new areas. You see, the island of Malta, where they realized later they are, was not on any of their itineraries. They had not planned to land there. They had not planned to port there. They had not planned to ever be in Malta, but the storm sent them to Malta. Who's the, who's the god of the storm? God. These storms carry us to places we've never been. As a church, it's causing us to rethink ministry. 
as a church. It's causing us to launch out into new and creative ways to be able to take the gospel to those who have never heard it, to strengthen believers, to worship, equip, engage in a brand new way. For you and your family, it's caused you, it's forced you to view things differently. It's taken you to a new land. Many of you are having Bible times, quiet times, prayer times. Many of you are doing things you've never done with your family before. It's carrying you to new areas. God is always, please get this, God is always calling His children to learn new things. He's always calling us to new experiences where we can apply the lessons and the truths of God's Word to our life. He is always calling us to take new ground and to deepen our relationship with Him. And this storm, the blessing in the mess, is that we're carried to new places. On that island, Paul finds out that the the island chief's dad was sick. And Paul goes over and heals the chief's dad. And word spreads throughout the island. But Paul's a healer. Shortly after he landed on the island, he gets bit by a poisonous snake, shakes it off because he knows the promise, I'm going to Rome. People are amazed at what what is happening in this, this guy that washed up on the beach. It gave them new opportunities to minister. But one of the things that Malta did, it also gave them new resources. Church, think about this as we draw this down to a close. Those believers, not yet. Those believers, those prisoners washed up on the beach, cold, wet, the Bible says they were warmed by a fire. And the the people, the inhabitants of the island showed them unusual kindness. And they were there and their needs were met. They were given new resources and they were sent back out on another boat to make the destination to Rome. Church, here's the important thing. You're probably aware of people right now that are going through this storm, and they are unshaken. They are steady. They are rock solid. And you look at them and you think, how in the world are they able to go through this while all the world is shaking? How are they able to go through this unshaken? Let me tell you something. Those people that you look at, and you see them unshaken, you see them unconcerned, not worried, but trusting and faithful, you know what? That's not their first storm. Malta is a Canaanite word that literally means refuge. So when you look out and you see those believers who are strong and stable, and I mean, they are solid, they are trusting God, listen to me, they are that way because they have been washed up on the beach. They've gone through the Euroclidon. They've gone through the Nor'easter. They've gone through the typhoon. They've trusted the promises of God. They realized their destination, and they crawled up on the beach, wet and cold, but alive. You see, here's the thing. It's not so much about what is this mess doing right now, but what is this mess teaching me for tomorrow? Church, I am so excited to see how we come out of this, what we look like on the other side of this, that when the next storm, when the next moment, when the next earth-shaking event happens, you and I can come out of that having learned the lesson of the storm, crawling up on the beach cold and wet but alive because we're trusting the promises of God that He will not abandon us, or forsake us. And even though we die as believers, yet we shall live. What is God doing right now? Are you shaken? Are you scared? Are you worried? Maybe like that duck that's still on the surface, but paddling 
like crazy under the water, maybe in a place where nobody can see and nobody knows you're terrified. The truth is this. The only answer for that fear in your heart, for the fear inside of you, is faith in Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says that we were all sinners. We're all sinners separated from God because of our sin. He's holy, we're not. And God had a plan before the world was ever formed that he was going to send his son to pay the price for lost man. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the eternal son of the eternal father, stepped down from heaven into the earth in the form of a man. And he lived the perfect life that you and I were unable to. He went through the storm of life. And he lived the perfect life, meeting all of the requirements of a holy God. And he died, stretched out on a cross as a sacrifice for you and I. And he said, it is finished. And when he said it is finished, it means sin's payment has been paid. And three days later, that dead body began to breathe again. And he rose up out of the tomb, showing that that payment for sin had been received by his father, and he truly had conquered death, hell, and the grave. So that today, if you and I will come to him, and friend, if you've never done that, today is the day. Now is the moment. For you to be able to say from your heart to God's God, I'm a sinner. And I know that. But today, I've heard the gospel, the good news. And I believe it. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And today, I receive that free gift by faith. As I turn my life, I submit my life over to you, the one who paid for it. The Bible says, all they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right now, this very moment, in your living room, in your car, in your garage, wherever you're at, right now you can bow your head. And from your heart to God, you can pray that prayer. You can say those words to God, I believe, I receive that free gift, I turn from my sins and turn to you. And at that moment, God saves you. And His Spirit abides, lives inside of you. And from that moment on, you will never for all eternity be without God. Church, Christian, don't just look at the message in the mess. Look at the blessings that are there. Be thankful that God rules all things well, and he, we know He works all things together for the good to those who love Him and are the called according to His purpose. If you've made a decision this morning, if you want to talk to one of us on staff, we want to encourage you to reach out to us through respond at firstjoplin.org or the phone number listed on the screen above. We want to be able to walk with you, pray with you. We want to be able to meet you where you are and help you along on that journey with Jesus Christ. Father, help us today to find place in our heart for this word. Father, bring peace to those who are shaken. Advance your kingdom, Lord, even if through a storm. And I pray today, Lord, that we will look on the other side of this as people of faith, having been refined through the fire. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for us.
turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Just sing that chorus one more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We want to say thanks so much for joining us again this morning. If you've made a decision today, we've got uh, Respond at Church uh, Respond at fbcjoplin.org. You can email that in, or you can text the number that's on your screen today. We'd love to know if you made a decision for Christ, or if you just want to talk to someone about something that you're struggling with or something that you need prayer for. We would love to hear from you. You can text that. Uh, you can email uh, respond at firstjoplin or fbcjoplin.org. Church, let's pray together and be be blessed today. Uh, I pray that God would bless your life. I hope, hope that you've been a blessing. I hope you've been blessed by tuning in this morning. Let's pray together as we dismiss. God, we thank you so much for being the reason why we gather today. God, we thank you so much for being a shelter in the midst of a storm. And God, we thank you that you can speak to us during times like this. God, help us to be attentive to what you have to say to us. Thank you for times with our family, God. Thank you for the small, even the big blessings that we miss out on. Uh, in times of struggle, but God, that we can just look around us and count our blessings today. Thank you for being the God overall, the God that's in control. God, we pray your blessings on each family, each person that's tuned in here today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you, church.